All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, a JavaScript news podcast, episode 29. We've come quite a long way here, and uh, yes, today we got quite a bunch of stuff and uh, quite a lot of very big releases, actually. So let's get cracking and let's get started with our articles and news section as always you can find the whole links and you know the everything that i mentioned basically on the github under the building x with js slash bxjs weekly repository the link should be in the channel description or if you're watching this on youtube or on dev2 in the video description um let's get started with our news so the first article we got today is called verbal expressions, regular expressions made easy. It is a pretty good introduction to a verbal expressions library that is actually available not just for JavaScript, but uh, for a bunch of other um, languages and makes writing uh, regular expressions uh, or complex regular expressions a breeze basically, right? So if you write a very simple regular expressions, it is not that hard so like the example here is you know it's it's quite easy to read as is if you know what the regular expressions are on the other hand if you write something more complex well then you're gonna have a bad time um, but verbal expressions allow you to write them like this you literally just spell it out you know it starts starts start of the line then it goes http then maybe there's an s then uh colon slash slash and then anything but spacebar and then at end of line that's how you write the exactly same regular expressions using verbal expressions. So if you've never heard of the library, do check it out. It is really neat. Uh, if you need to write complex uh, regular expressions, it is amazing. Uh, and yeah, I would highly recommend looking into it. Hey, Bagao, welcome to the stream. Okay, um, again, you know, if you're writing simple regular expressions, I would just say just write them as is because I don't think it brings any uh, benefits or like very short ones. But if you are writing complex ones, yes, it can be a lifesaver because this is way more readable than a very long and complex regular expression. Okay, next article we got is you should be using ESM. Um, this is basically a short introduction to ESM. If you are not familiar with it, it's a tool library that allows you to use uh, ES6 modules in Node.js right now in a very, very simple way. So, uh, and requires nearly zero setup for like 90% of the tools, including Node tap and, you know, like test runners, tape, whatever. And yeah, so if you wanted uh, to use ES6 modules in Node.js now without doing Babel and other stuff, then do check out this article. It will give you a quick introduction to how to use ASM and what exactly you can do with it. Let me have a quick look at the chat. Um, it's a lot easier to read for your team too. Yes, definitely. Like as I, as, I, as I was saying, I think that basically if you're writing anything that is more complex and longer than, I don't know, 10 symbols or something, then verbal regular expressions can be way easier to maintain because like, you know, Writing anything complex in regular expression is always like a test of your memory, basically. Because like, can I remember what this pattern means? <laughs> yeah, it can make your life a lot easier. Okay, continuing, we got introduction to readable JavaScript just in time for the discussion. So this is a um, sort of meta article that gives you a bunch of rules that are supposed to make your code better, right? So, but those are not sort of the absolute rules that you should follow, neither do consider it the only rules that you should follow, but there are some good pointers in here. So basically, if you are at this stage where you know you already <clears throat> know and understand JavaScript good enough, but you're looking to make your code better, make your code easier to understand, make your code more readable, do check this article out, Will it will give you some good pointers. Uh, admittedly, there is some uh, things here. So like there's the example here, for example, where they use the uh, absolute multiplication uh, by four, right, using the bit shifts. The thing is that from time to time, uh, writing like this can actually be justified by, for example, performance, right, because the bit shifts operators, uh, bit shifts operations are actually way faster than anything else. Uh, I, it might not be faster with the um, 
uh, if expression here, but it will be faster on its own than like say multiplication, right? So in some cases that might be justified. And in this case, please put a comment in there that explains what the hell happens. But yeah, uh, it's like the example is contrived and author talks about it. So, you know, it's all fair. Uh, yeah, stuff like consistent style, keep away from magic, make sure you message what you actually do correctly through the variable names and stuff like this, split the code into smaller functions and all those things with a pretty good example. So, you know, again, if you've been at this stage when you are, uh, you already understand JavaScript pretty well, but want to make it more readable, want to make your code style more consistent, there is some good pointers in here. Do have a look. Okay. Next article we got is understanding JavaScript's prototypical inheritance. Um, exactly what you would expect. This is an article about proto prototypical inheritance. It talks about JavaScript types as in, you know, there's primitives and there's objects, which is basically everything that is not primitive. And then it talks about what, how the objects are constructed, uh, how the prototypes works, how does the prototypical inheritance works. There is no mention of classes. So it's purely prototypical uh, prototypes talk basically. Uh, and um, yeah, like if you know what the prototypes are, if you know how the objects work in a JavaScript, you won't really find anything new in here. If you are still trying to figure it out, then you will probably find uh, quite a lot of good pointers here. Uh, maybe it will really completely clear it out for you. So it's a really good starter article. Let's put it this way. Add uh, a lot of comments for bitwise operator. I wouldn't say a lot, but you know, at least explain what you were doing here. It's, it's like I already was saying it at some point on some stream that like I, it takes a lot of time for me to process anything like that is like, you know, bitwise, bit shifting or whatever. I always sit there and just stare at it for like five minutes be like, okay, so what is happening here? I don't know why it's hard for me. Maybe again, because you know, I don't use it uh, frequently enough, but it always like, uh, it's like really takes effort to understand. So please write comments. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> next article we got. Intercepting and modifying responses with Chrome via DevTools protocol. A really cool uh, demo of what the Chrome DevTools protocol can do. So it shows you how to create your own script that would launch the Google Chrome with the specific flags, connect to this Google Chrome using the Chrome remote interface, all of that from Node.js, and then tap into the network requests and add an interceptor that would basically intercept any incoming requests. And then you could take those requests and actually do something to them. So like modify a response body, for example. Um, the tutorial itself is pretty basic, but if you did not know you could actually do that, it will give you a really good introduction to how to tap into the whole Chrome DevTools and the Chrome remote protocol and all of that stuff, which is pretty good. I, the question, uh, so something I did not investigate myself is that basically the puppeteer is built around this whole thing, right? So theoretically puppeteer should allow you to tap into requests as well, but I don't know if it does. So you know what, let's just, uh, let's just check it out. So let me just drop this on the left. Puppeteer, um, yes, we want puppeteer repository and I am curious now request, um, no, not puppeteer. Do they have a docs? I'm guessing they removed all the dogs from the readme. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the puppeteer website and let's see, they have requests, uh, which is whenever a page send requests, following events are emitted requests response. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you can basically override request. Yeah. So puppeteer allows you to do this exact same thing, but without actually tapping into Chrome yourself, which is also nice. But you know, if you need uh, even lower level control than Puppeteer offers, because Puppeteer still doesn't have some features, then do check this tutorial out. Maybe you will find, uh, what do you have? Um, uh, stream delay should not be that big. At least I've set in the settings to be, you know, the lowest possible, but you never know how Twitch works. So yeah, it's basically up to Twitch. Okay, the next article we got uh, is improving data view performance in V8 from the V8 engine team. So this is another one of those super low level articles going in depth into the how V8 works. This time around they talk about the data views, which is one of two possible ways to do low level memory access in JavaScript. Um, the other one being typed arrays. 
This is something I did not know about before reading this article. So if you never heard about data views, um, basically they explain what it is and how it works here and why they were introduced and so on and so forth. And the article also talks about why they were introduced and how exactly they work and how exactly they improve performance. And performance improvements as usual are like insane. So if you if you look at this screen right now, if you are not watching, uh, if you're watching this podcast, not listening to it, then you can see that the improvements is like nearly four times uh, or maybe 3.5 times and um, sometimes uh, 16 times as fast, which is kind of insane when you think about it. So yeah, it is another pretty deep dive into the V8 engine internals. Uh, again, data views in this case. Um, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, do check it out. It is very interesting to read. And there is, as usual, some crazy performance improvements related to this um, data type, I guess. Okay, next article we got is Immutability in React and Redux, the complete guide. A very, very big guide, as you can see right now on the screen, uh, I don't know, 40 pages, maybe even more, that talks about the React immutability state management, specifically Redux. And uh, then also what I found interesting talks about Emer. Talks about actually using Emer to improve upon Redux, which is uh, the sentiment that I've seen in the community quite a lot lately. Uh, so, you know, if you are starting to work with Redux, if you're still struggling with the whole immutability thing, why should you do it in a mutable way? How is it done? There is a lot of examples here. There's a lot of common cases and like recipes, um, updating objects, updating keys. Uh, and it is a very good article. So again, you know, if you're working with React Redux and struggling with immutability, understanding it, then do check it out. It is pretty good. Um, the author writes some good stuff. I think, yeah, I think this is not the first article I've seen from him and it has been pretty good as well. How to learn air visual guide to state, free react courses, all posts. There we go. Well, we'll probably seen something from him already. Um, Redux versus the context. Oh yeah. We've seen this Redux versus the context API from him. It was quite good. Also, you know, the title is very clickbaity as we already discussed, but Indeed, the author has very, uh, like, writes some very good articles. So Dave Cedia, if you are interested, check him out. He does some pretty good stuff. All right. Next thing we got is an article from Brian Holt, who is um, doing some pretty good Node work. And I think he's a core contributor to Node. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken. I don't, like, honestly, <laughs> wait a second. I do remember that I follow him on Twitter and I do remember that I used a couple of his projects uh, on GitHub. So let me try to remember what the hell was it. Um, repositories, uh, node versions. Oh yeah, React, no wait, React Loadable is a fork. Uh, am I mistaken, was it the articles? He was, he was, he is a contributor to Prettier, I think. Okay, I guess it was his articles. Right. So anyway, he's the, so one thing to bear in mind about this whole article is that he's a cloud dev advocate at Microsoft. So he is going to be pitching a lot for Microsoft cloud and Azure tools and everything, but that doesn't make the article less interesting. So the article is called 11 tips to scale Node.js. And it talks about, well, you writing your Node.js apps in a way that is going to be scalable, right? And because uh, the author worked in the companies like Netflix, Reddit, Walmart, and eBay, he has quite a lot of experience in writing and scaling Node.js things. And um, yeah, so there's like 70, 11 tips here. Wait, wait, yes, 11 tips here. Uh, a lot of them are very sort of things that you would, you know, if you would write Node.js code for more than a year, you probably would know that like write quality codes, the sooner you start linting, formatting and type checking and set it up in CI to stop the bike shading, the better it will be, which is, you know, quite obvious. Write a gradient of tests, you know, design for stateless. This is less obvious actually. So it, it ranges from, you know, those like super obvious things to more fine grained advices that come from, you know, scaling a lot of apps within the uh, companies like Netflix who are like very heavily microservice driven. So like design for stateless 
is what you typically do with microservices, right? So because microservices have to be stateless because then it's really easy to scale them. You just spawn more of them and the load balancer does the rest, right? But before you actually start writing them, you never think about that. So uh, you never think that it's actually hard to scale something that has state. Okay, yeah. And then this talks about, yeah, okay, serve uh, static stuff from content delivery networks like Azure K, uh, CDN. So again, saying, you know, that he's pitching for Microsoft here. Nothing wrong with that, but just keep it in mind. Deploy early, deploy often, deploy to servers right away. So yeah, again, staging and production and testing and all of that kind of stuff is important. Don't fear the queue, microservices and containers at scale and so on and so on. Like there is a lot of really good advice in here. Like, again, the author does have a ton of experience and uh, um, wait a second, was it his articles? I think it was his article in Chromebook. Man, where did I? Okay, whatever, you know what? I'm not gonna try to remember where the hell uh, was I seeing him before, but I know that I follow him on Twitter and he posts really good stuff. So this is one of them. So if you're interested in taking your node to the next level and making your node app scalable, do check those tips up. They are general, so there's no source code or anything here. So they're more related to architecture and sort of thought process, but they are quite good. Okay. Um, next article we got is demystifying webpack. It's basically a tutorial talking about the webpack and in general bundlers. So what is bundlers? Why do you need it? How exactly does it work? What is dependency graph? How does tree shaking works? How does modular resolution work? And all kind of stuff like this. So it is very basic. So if you know, if you already know what the bundler is, if you know what the webpack is, and you know all those basic things about it, you probably won't find anything new here. If you are just getting into the whole area of bundling, or you never heard about that, this is a really good introduction that will tell you everything you need to know about what the bundler is. How does it work? What the most common concepts used in it and uh, some specifics about the webpack. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. Okay, next thing we got is shipping React Native apps with Fastlane and Travis. Pretty cool post about setting up the continuous delivery for React Native apps using Travis CI and the Fastlane. So the Travis is the CI service and the Fastlane is the uh, service for building um, mobile apps and shipping them directly to the stores as far as I understood, which means that, apologies, <clears throat> which means that basically you can configure your release pipeline once and then once you push your new release, be it release tag or master branch or whatever, you know, however you set up your Git flow the CI solution will automatically do all the work for you, uh, including so the lane can, you know, bump the version number for you, push it to can release, push it to production, push it to repositories, commit and push version bump, notify in Slack and do whatever the hell you want. So it seems to be pretty sophisticated system. So if you are working with the mobile apps and you are looking to uh, set up complete continuous delivery, and you are interested in things like this, I personally think this is absolutely awesome. And uh, we, once we get to this stage in the apps we're building right now, I will probably use that as well, because this looks like, you know, it basically takes away the whole pain of code signing and build signing and canary releases and in, in beta testing and all of that stuff, which is always annoying, right? So the code signing is like one of the things that is, I think the it, at least it used to be the most painful on the like, especially iOS, um, iOS uh, apps. So the Android was a bit better at the time. I know that Android right now is super easy, but I, I haven't actually checked, like I haven't developed iOS apps that I shipped into the app store for five years. So I don't know how is it there. Hopefully they made it better. So yeah, uh, but yeah, anyway, if you're interested in setting up continuous deployment for your React Native apps, then do check this article out. It is really good and will give you everything you need to know about Fastlane and Travis and uh, the configs and recipes and whatever the hell you want to set this up. Okay, next article we got is create a project using npm init initializer command. So this is a look uh, into how you can execute the initializers with npm. Uh, like the old way used to be, you know, we do, so the, here's the uh, author uses example, create React app. 
And the old way used to be npm install minus g create react app, and then you run create react app, whatever the name, right? Which is a bit annoying. NPM 5.2 introduced NPX, where you can just say NPX, create React app, and then the parameters, and that works, it's always nice. The problem is it can be a bit slow, right? So because it still pulls and installs all the things and then cleans up and then it's a bit annoying. So NPM 6.1 actually introduced NPM init commands where you can say NPM init react minus app. So you omit the first create prefix which will be automatically prepended by the NPM because NPM init assumes that those are called create minus whatever. And it will be executed, which is really, really nice. Uh, it is more or less the same as NPX. Um, I don't think it, it gives any uh, advantage over it, but it's just basically nicer because uh, it's sort of a common way of doing it. You know, you can just say npm init react app and you're done, right? So which is kind of convenient. You can say npm init ESM, for example, and you will get the ESM project that is automatically set up for you. So um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very short tip essentially, but uh, pretty neat. And there's also a video available where you can uh, have a look at this stuff in action. So that sounds interesting, do check it out. Right, next article we got is React.js, a better introduction to the most powerful UI library ever created. Um, very clickbaity title. I would not call the React.js a most powerful UI library ever created. But hey, this is an intro to React and a pretty in-depth one. So if you are just starting out with React and you are still pondering how to get started and how to configure everything and what are the bad practices might be, although I would argue that in this case, sometimes author does not explain clearly enough why are those bad practices, because there are a couple of places where I was like, so why is it bad? I don't, like, I genuinely don't understand why some of those things are bad. But yeah, you know, like as a starter article, it's quite good. Don't take everything as a hundred percent truth as usual. That's like, a, I think a typical advice about every article that tries to teach you anything. Uh, but it is a pretty good introduction to React and how do you write it from scratch and how exactly do you build a very basic app with it. Um, if you already know React, if you already know how it works, you won't really find anything interesting in here. You might as well skip it. Okay, next article we got is React Component Patterns, another entry-level article. So this is again for people who just started working with React so you know what React is. You read previous article, yes, and you know what React is now, you know how it works, but you are still confused about the component patterns and how you can apply them. So what is the stateful? What is the stateless component? What are the containers? What are the presentational components? What are higher order components? And what are the render callbacks, EA render props, and so on and so forth. It's not that long, so it's actually pretty short. I would call it almost a cheat sheet with a bit of explanation of what's going on, but it basically shows how the most common patterns work. If you uh, like, if you heard, if you know all those patterns that I listed in the beginning, stateful, stateless, container, presentational, higher order, and render props, you won't really find anything new in here. If you don't know them, then do look through it. I mean, it is, as I said, it's pretty short and the code is pretty nicely given and explained. So you will learn about those patterns uh, pretty quick in a couple of minutes, basically. Okay. Next article we got is rethinking JavaScript test coverage. This is a really cool one. So it's from Benjamin Ko, who is a lead maintainer of a package called Istanbul, which does code coverage for testing. So, you know, whenever you write your tests, you need to know the test coverage, right, for the files and Istanbul did that thing. Um, so the article talks through about how the test coverage was done historically, right? So if you never tried to look at the, or never used tools like Istanbul or Blanket or whatever, and you didn't know how exactly the coverage was generated, then it was by injecting the uh, special lines that would basically rewrite the thing. So you can see here the example, it injects uh, counters that are adding, uh, oh God, incrementing the, counters, essentially, it's, you know, like some counter plus plus, right? If that counter is incremented, then the line got triggered. If not, then well, it didn't get triggered. 
And we're basically inserted between every possible uh, instruction, I think. So you actually know what exactly is happening. And I think it's like, you know, one for function, one for scope, and then you get one for if and one for else, right? Um, there are obvious like problems with it, shortcomings and annoyances related to that. You can read about them uh, in the article. The cool thing is that uh, in at some point, I believe, yeah, it was in August uh, 2017 when the ESM module support landed in V8. Uh, there, there's basically a period of problem, right? So all this instrumentation of the code done through overriding of require function. So you take this require function, you change it and rewrite it so that it inserts those plus plus uh, statements into every line, right? Uh, because uh, the ES6 modules were working differently, it was not actually possible to do that. So it has been uh, ESM, like this made difficult. So I'll, I'm just gonna read the, yeah, I'm just gonna read you the sentence. Bradley's rewrite of Node.js loader to support ESM modules no longer supported hooking required statements. This made it difficult for Istanbul to detect the ESM module has been loaded and instrumented. So which means there was like a lot of people were annoyed because, you know, Istanbul just stopped working on his ESM modules and it was a bit of annoyance. Uh, the cool thing is V8 at some point introduced the coverage uh, support for coverage. I mean, you already know that, you know, if you open the um, network, oh, pff, God damn it. If you open the inspector and then if you go into the, where does the coverage i'm always forgetting where you do that so there is actually coverage yes there is a special coverage tab and if you just instrument the code you'll actually see how much of the javascript css or whatever is used by the page and obviously if you refresh that it will actually gather it from the start so we actually see the numbers that are correct so in this case as you can see here we have almost two megabytes of unused javascript um, there you go, medium, nice work. Uh, so yes, uh, this is a very helpful thing, especially when you optimize um, websites and you know you may, you wanna make your code efficient, but it also is useful for maintainers of the tools like Istanbul, right? Because they can actually leverage it to provide the coverage using native tools instead of doing like the ha hacks like this by instrumenting the code. So there is this uh, C8 tool, which basically pulls together entire inspector dance into a single command. And you just run C8 node foo.js and you get the coverage, which is super convenient. So there's like, if you want to know more details do have a look at the article, it gives some additional interesting things. I believe it only available at node 10, node 10, 10 even. Okay, so even more. Uh, it requires the special node V8 coverage uh, environment variable. And uh, yeah, there is, a lot more interesting things in the article, basically. So do check it out if that sounds like a topic you are curious about. Okay, next thing we got is comparison of state management solutions for React. Another basic, uh, or uh, basic is not a correct word, entry level React article talking about the state management solutions for React. So it talks about, you know, why do we need state at all? What kind of setting do we have? How can you use component state? How can you use context API to manage sort of more complex state? How can you use unstated, which is by the way, my favorite library so far to use a state that is, you know, uh, relatively, I guess, medium in size, right? And then now you can migrate to Redux, which is even more complex and allows you to manage super complex and large applications. And then now we can introduce stuff like Redux Thunk uh, to allow for, you know, more idiomatic approach. And then there's Apollo link state overview, which is the GraphQL based Apollo uh, based uh, library that basically links the state to Apollo server, which I'm sure also won't work in all cases, but you know, kind of nice. So yes, if you are still figuring out your state management in React, if you're trying to figure out what kind of uh, state library do you want and how does it all work, do check this article out. You will find a um, decent introduction to it. Okay, next article we got is authentication for your React and Express application with JSON web tokens. Uh, it is essentially a tutorial on how to build a React and React router app 
with a backend that uses Express, MongoDB, and Mongoose, and the app will use JSON web tokens that are stored in cookies to authenticate. If all of those words sound like something you already know, you won't really find anything new in here. It is very basic. If you were struggling with uh, setting up authentication for your React app, then, uh, well, you probably will figure it out in this article. So it gives you all code for backend, all code for frontend, guides you step by step through everything, explains how all of that stuff works, how does the token getting, you know, how does it stored in, in cookies, how does session validation works, and so on and so forth. So yeah, if you were looking for health tutorial for React using JSON web tokens, do check it out. If you already know all that, well, you might skip it. Okay, next article we got is bundle your node app to single executable for Windows, Linux, and OS X, or rather Mac OS, because OS X is not exactly the name of it, but there we go. Okay, so the article talks about using a bunch of tools, uh, in this case, primarily PKG from Sidefolks, to package your uh, node app into one uh, nice executable that you can just share with someone. And uh, how do you actually do that? How do you package additional resources with it? And so on and so forth. So it's basically a basic tutorial. I thought I would highlight it because uh, it turns out not a lot of people know about those tools. Not a lot of people know that you can actually do that, but it can be extremely helpful. So uh, I can tell you that this is, pretty, uh, not just, um, no, it doesn't use Electron, it's literally Node.js with your code. So it takes the code, it minifies it, and then plugs it into the, I believe it's, it's even trickier than that. So I think it's like, it takes the code, it, uh, was it, it generated the V8, um, oh, wait a second, what was the, they had some description of how it worked. Snapshot, right, exactly. This is what I call it. Um, I believe, was it assets, native add-ons? <sighs> okay, so V8 has those um, globs, right, there you go. This is what I'm looking for. So basically when V8 takes your source code, it generates the intermediate representation, which results in like a glob of data essentially like lower level code, right? So uh, from my understanding, at least I might be wrong, but this is what I remember from reading the uh, source code, basically it takes your JavaScript, it compiles it to one file essentially, then throws it, or maybe just throws it into V8, gets this globe that will be executed and bundles it together with the app. Uh, NVGS is basically Electron just with a different name. So it's slightly different, but it's it's basically the same as Electron. This is just Node.js and just your code. So I used it in ExoFrame and um, basically I have the CI set up so that my, um, every time I release a new build, the uh, build server will basically compile those binaries and just upload them here. So instead of installing it, installing Node.js, installing NPM, and then installing ExoFrame, you can just grab one of those binaries. And as you can see here, it's like 30, 40 megabytes, which is way better than if you would, you know, install Node, install NPM, drag all those packages, and then you can just run it. It doesn't require any additional dependencies, it just runs, which is really great. So if you if you are shipping, like ExoFrame is a command line tool, right? So this works perfectly well for it. So if you're shipping command line tools, this is a really cool uh, thing. Do check it out if you if that sounds interesting. Then again, you know, I was talking about the pre-compiling the code with V8, but I don't know if it actually, how it does it, but I think it is. But like, if you know, if you're maybe working on it or if you've digged, uh, dug into the, internals and know more about it, do tell us more. I would be very curious. This that was my understanding from reading the code like a couple of years ago or a year ago or two years ago. Hell if I remember when, okay, whatever. Let us continue. Right, the next article we got is Beginner's Guide to Amazon Web Services Elastic Binstalk using Node.js. Um, so there's this Amazon Web Services Elastic Beanstalk which is a DevOps service that allows you to quickly scaffold things from recipes, basically, right? It is um, more, or I would say it is, like as the author here compares, it's basically 
easier than digital ocean or amazon web services ec2 because those are literally just services uh, servers right but it is harder than like heroku or firebase that just give you zero configuration solutions so it's somewhere in the middle of them and um because it's amazon web services it's pretty complex due to you know all the stuff that it can actually do and it has a lot of edge cases that you can basically shoot yourself in the foot but it does allow you to do pretty cool things like you know auto setting up auto scaling groups for your app and then it's auto setting up security groups availability zones separating your database from the app and so on like adding load balancers and basically scaffolding your whole app on amazon web services which is really nice and uh, this tutorial talks about how do you do that uh, with node.js specifically how do you configure everything how do you do the recipes and what kind of problems can you encounter during it so there's like eb ignore stuff eb extensions and then how do you handle the static files https setup and additional ways to screw yourself up as the author says so if you're working with amazon web services or wanted to start working with them do check out this article it will give you a pretty good introduction to the beanstalk which is uh i actually never used it but it does does look like a pretty nice service okay Continuing, we got another tutorial about Amazon Web Services because there's never enough tutorials about Amazon Web Services because they're just too damn complex. So this one is called how to send SMS using Amazon SNS and Node.js. Uh, so Amazon has this SNS, which is simple notification service that allows you to send notifications through various channels, including SMS. And this article uh, walks you through the whole process of creating new SNS uh, project creating a new topic, setting up your Node.js project and actually sending an SMS using it, which is actually quite trivial. But if you ever wanted to send SMS, you can do that. Or for, yeah, yeah, if you're forced to work with Amazon, sure, yeah, that's, that's an option too. Like, um, I wouldn't say it's bad. It's just like they have so many things that it's really hard to get your, you know, wrap your head, or, uh, wrap your head around it is what I'm trying to say. Okay, uh, next thing we got is idle until urgent. Um, this one is really, really, really cool. So there's an article talks about improving the uh, uh, first input delay, right? So you, you have this concept of first input delay whenever the site becomes interactive, right? Uh, I think it is what first input delay means, if I remember correctly, unless I'm confusing the topics, uh, come on. First input delay, uh, first contentful paint, first input delay. Uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, okay. So it's basically whenever the side becomes interactive, right? And um, the author here gives an example. Okay, he has a simple blog and the blog has like 300 milliseconds first input delay, which is not nice. So he started figuring out why is it happens and how can you make it better? And he found one of the culprits was this date time format function that, well, or, uh, yeah, in, inter, inter, uh, I hate this word, internationalization, date time format function, right? That prints the date time in your local format, whatever the hell you want it to be. So, um, after some thinking, he came up with this pattern that basically does important things right away and then does unimportant things whenever there's idle, um, whenever the browser is idle, right? So you have this request idle callback function, which basically is triggered whenever the browser is not no longer doing anything. And from doing that, he came up with this pattern that's called idle until urgent, which basically says, okay, so instead of just immediately uh, creating this formatter and formatting the date, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create this new idle value that has this callback that returns the actually immediately created thing, right? And the way the idle value works is that it requests the callback, right? And if the callback is triggered before, it will set the value already. But if the get value is called before the callback is executed, it will cancel the callback and immediately call the value. So it's sort of, you know, it will delay 
until it's urgent. So until the user says, hey, I want to see that right now, which is a really awesome pattern, actually. Um, I don't know if that's actually published as a library because I, like, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not even sure if you want to publish that as a library, but the pattern is really, really cool. I'm really digging it. And I think I would probably use it in my code in quite a bunch of places. So the same works, you know, so it's not just for this expensive like rendering, but you can also use it for a lot of different things like injecting Google Analytics into page, right? Because you don't really need them immediately. You can just say, hey, um, wait a bit and then inject them whenever. And you can also have the task use that work like this, right? So there's like expansion of the whole pattern. So if this whole thing sounds interesting and I really like, from my opinion, that sounds really, really cool, then do check this article out. I found it to be pretty awesome. Uh, if that does not sound interesting, well, then do not check it out, I guess, but uh, you will, I think it is, I would highly recommend reading it. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. Okay. Next article we got is building a progressive web app using Angular 6. And this is exactly what you would expect. It is a um, tutorial on how to build a progressive web app using Angular from the very start to the very end, including service workers and icons and everything. Um, can't really tell you more about it. I don't really use Angular much, but you know, if you're using Angular and you're interested how to expand it to a progressive web app, do check it out. Maybe you'll learn a few things. Okay. Um, isn't it like a loader? Uh, not ex I mean, loader, depending on what you mean by loader, right? So, uh, in this case, this thing will, so let, let's put it this way. So as soon as the react component is rendered, right, this value will appear. The thing is until this react component is rendered, the value will remain idle and if it's idle and if the browser has this request idle callback available, it will actually be rendered prior to rendering. So it's sort of, it will be rendered if there's idle resources available essentially. So it's not exactly like loader, but like just, just read the, read the code. It is really, really cool. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about the next article. So the next article we got is called the backwards commercial license, which I also found to be pretty cool. So it's from, Aaron Hammer, who is an, uh, one of the maintainers of uh, Hoppy, and I think creator of Hoppy. Uh, so the idea <clears throat> is that he, um, last year he, want, he wrote the article about how he wanted to make his open source work sustainable through corporate sponsorship, right? And um, the whole idea is that uh, yeah, so it's been a great run and the sponsorship dropped by 60% and no longer, he no longer sees it a viable path forward, which actually makes me very sad. But here's the idea. So he came up with this idea. He plans to introduce a commercial license for all of his open source projects. Uh, and it's not going to be like a normal license where, you know, you typically have the dual licensing or anything like this. It's actually going to be um, different. So there's like a bit a long a lot more explanation of why he decided to do that if you are interested do read it but the gist of it is that any version that is the latest one is going to be free open source and licensed into whatever the hell you want right so like MIT or I don't know I I think happy is MIT is it MIT happy uh BJ is getting started I think it was something either MIT or uh, hobby license, copyright reserved, Walmart, Yahoo. Yeah, it is. It is basically MIT. Okay. So the latest version will always stay MIT and will always be open source, right? And uh, all the older versions, basically anything legacy that still receives updates and gets, you know, like security fixes and whatever. We we'll actually have commercial licenses. So if you decide that, okay, you know, we have this legacy project and we don't want to update to the latest uh, version, you actually have to pay, which is, I assume, something that a lot of those companies will do because enterprise never likes to update their libraries. <laughs> this is a brilliant idea in my opinion. And um, I'm really curious to see what the results of implementing this license will be in a year. 
and how all of this will go. So we're gonna keep an eye on that and uh, see, um, yeah, see what, what what how it basically turns out. But I think it's a really cool idea, and it's very interesting to see how it will develop. And also, it's also interesting. I guess you so basically you uh, specific versions have licenses, right? So. I wonder how it works. So for example, I built my project with a hop, current version of Happy and then I just stopped maintaining it. So like my, you know, hobby project or whatever. And then this version of Happy becomes old one, but I theoretically it should be as, under the same MIT license. So you cannot change the license for already published version, right? So basically any updates will be commercial. I guess this is what he means. But we're going to see, like, I'm fascinated by the whole idea and uh, really curious to see how this will end up. Yeah. Okay, continuing, we got Underrun making off. So uh, there's been this GS 13 key, uh, 13 key, no, 13 K games, a competition of writing 13 kilobyte games in JavaScript. And this is the article from the winner of the competition, uh, the game called Underrun, a twin stick shooter using WebGL in 13 kilobytes of JavaScript. Uh, we're gonna have a look at it later on in the demo section. And uh, this article basically is a write up of how exactly the author wrote it, how exactly did he manage to fit everything into 13 kilobytes and what technologies was used and so on and so forth, which is actually fascinating to read. If you're interested in uh, crazy optimization techniques and uh, game making in JavaScript, do have a look. It is really entertaining to read. Um, okay, next thing we got is a small tip, I guess. So um, there's the new macOS version coming out quite soon and it has this dark mode thing uh, integrated into the OS itself. The cool thing is that they also added a CSS media query that tells you if the interface is dark or not. So you can actually add a CSS uh, to your website that will switch to the dark mode if the user OS is in dark mode. It is really neat and would be very interested to see something like this in Windows as well because I do like my dark modes for just about everything and auto switching between them as well. This is like one of the cool features of Twitter, for example. So yes, quite cool and uh, pretty cool that they have a media query for it. Uh, I hope it also will be standardized because, you know, having non-standard things is not something I'm a fan of. Okay, next uh, tiny news we have is a bit of a good news for the guys using Node.js on Windows. The next release uh, for Windows will include a checkbox that will automatically install all the necessary tools that are required for building native add-ons like Python, VS build tools and all that kind of stuff. So you no longer have to do it manually, which solves a lot of pain points that people had with it, which is always nice to see. Okay, next thing we got is explore the immersive web with Firefox reality now available for Wiveport, Oculus and Daydream. So Firefox guys just went ahead and made something crazy. Um, they made a virtual reality version of Firefox. And yeah, you, you, can, you can talk to it. You can use it in Oculus Vive or whatever. And it has like full gesture control support and everything. It looks pretty good actually. Like it even has the private browsing and <laughs> it's kind of neat that that's a thing now. Like. I, I don't know if I would browse in, in virtual reality. Like, I, I don't know, like Vive probably is already has a, you know, high resolution enough to be able to read large text, but comfortably browsing websites is different question, but I would, I would probably be up for trying it. Uh, it's really cool to see it, you know, being a thing anyway. So it's pretty cool. If you have a um, Oculus or Vive headset or Daydream headset, you can just go ahead and grab it. Uh, it does support mobile headsets as well, which is pretty cool. Okay, um, last article I think we have. No, not the last one. That's one of the closer to the end, but not the last one yet. It's called Software Disenchantment. It is more or less of a generic software engineering article, or I guess you could call it software engineering rant. So the author here rants about how software people are happy about programs being terrible in performance. You know, like if uh, modern cars and buildings use just enough materials they want or cars work at like 90% of what's physically possible, which I don't think is true as well, but you know, 
maybe not the best analogy. The thing is that uh, it's not the same with software, right? We have a lot of software that is slow, that is annoying, and nobody cares. Like, yeah, Google Inbox or Google Mail is a pretty good example. It is one of the slowest apps that I use every day, and it hasn't changed in speed for past hells no how many years. I think it only got slower actually over time, but uh, it makes me... <laughs> It is a bit a bit painful. Windows 10 takes 30 minutes to update. That's also a problem, even with an SSD. Yes, it is. There's a lot of pain points here and, uh, you know, like the sizes and decay and everything and uh, Bluetooth headphones problem. Yes, um, a lot of ranting about broken things in software and uh, as a final thing is like, you know, we should we should make world better and i also completely agree with that whenever i try to write something i try to make it uh you know at least from the user experience as good as possible so i don't think it's it's that hard to go additional extra mile to make it slightly faster to make it slightly more reliable slightly more predictable and it's going to be better for everyone. So if you're building something that is human facing, please take that extra mile, walk that extra mile and make it just just a tiny bit better. Let's let's make this let's make the software better. Please. I don't want slow things. <laughs> it's hard to achieve though. We get the goal, but where's the road? It's not hard to achieve. You just sit there and optimize it until it works. Like literally, you have all the tools you want. There's profilers, there's debuggers, there's the tooling in for development has never been better, like literally, the, especially in JavaScript world. And you complain, come on, man. <laughs> There's like, it's it's not that hard. You have like, you literally, you have the dev, everything is in dev tools. You have the memory snapshots, like right? you can just press a button and you will get the memory. There you go. This is what takes the memory. You now know where what you need to optimize. You go into the, uh, I don't know, uh, performance and you hit a button to record, you refresh the page, you stop it and now you know what it's a lot of time, right? You can zoom in and see, hey, this function layouting takes a lot of time, but I cannot really do anything about it. And then there's, hey, there's some JavaScript that takes the whole 20 milliseconds. jQuery, of course it's jQuery. <laughs> it is not hard, like for real. It is not hard in 2018 to do that. So just, just take this like, you know, a few more days and make it nicer. All right, let's, let's stop ranting and let's continue. Okay, yes, a uh, bit of a good news. Uh, Microsoft is joining Hacktoberfest this year. So if you make a pull request to any of the uh, open source repositories they have on GitHub, during October, you will get a special edition t-shirt designed by uh, Ashley McNamara, whoever that is. I honestly don't know, but hey, it's a Microsoft t-shirt, so... Why not? You know, participate in Hacktoberfest. It's always fun. And I believe the announcement for Hacktoberfest itself is coming next week. So I'm going to keep an eye on that and I'm going to get my t-shirts this year as well. <laughs> All right. Now we got to the releases section. We got a ton of them this time around and a lot of them are really, really big. Uh, the first major release of this week is Next.js version 7. It is, well, it has a lot of things, a lot of really good things. Uh, so we got 57% faster boot up, 42% faster recompilation. Finally, better error reporting using React Error Overlay. So no more this something, something happened. You actually see the good errors that show you exact place where something broke. This is finally happened, it works. Uh, another good thing, we got the Webpack 4, obviously, and because it's Webpack 4, there's a bunch of related improvements like CSS imports, for example. So the Webpack 4 has a new way of extracting CSS and there's a new mini extract CSS plugin now. So first of all, the dynamic CSS import now works. And second of all, you no longer have to do this in your document JS, which is nice, finally. Uh, it's also standardized dynamic imports now. Uh, this, like, I think they've been around more or less for a while, but you know, now you can just use dynamic wrapper and basically it works. So, which is always a welcome addition. 
We now have Babel 7 that adds uh, TypeScript support, Fragment support, Babel config.js, and a bunch of overrides, uh, which is always nice. And now the, uh, the config is just like 10 times simpler as well. Smaller initial HTML payload, static CDN support if you want it, style J6 version 3, and is just, yeah, this one was really cool, I thought. So the React context is now shared between the app and pages uh, in the server-side rendering. So you, you can you can literally need it in server-side rendering and it will be, seems like it will be passed to the client, which is kind of amazing. So yeah, it is a pretty cool to see. It is awesome and I can't wait to migrate all my apps to it because they will be a lot, uh, a lot cooler. Um, I open minded to join a startup. Uh, well, I mean, just write me up. Let's talk. I'm always open to new ventures, but uh, you, you know, uh, yeah, sure. Let's talk. Um, that's that's the first time I get headhunted on a <laughs> Twitch. Okay, let us continue. The next thing we got is Gatsby version two, which basically also updates to Webpack 4, Babel 7, React 16.5 and reduces build times and the runtime by a lot. I've honestly never used Gatsby, but it's basically a static website generator. Uh, so, you know, if you're using it, you probably know what it is. If you're not using it, then, well, it's a static website generator that supports a lot of sort of input things and output things uh, where you can define a lot of data sources and compile them to a lot of different templates, basically, including like GraphQL and everything. So it's pretty crazy, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it is pretty neat. So, you know, if you are using it, you're probably very happy with the update. If not, then maybe check it out. Maybe this is the tool you're working. Let me try that again. Maybe this is the tool you were looking for. Okay. Uh, next release we got is Electron 3.0, the major highlight of the release being basically Chrome 66, which is still three versions lagging behind the actual release for whatever reason. Note 10.2, which is also lagging and uh, V8 6.6 .6 because again, Chrome 66. I'm curious what's the reason behind those sort of the uh, version lags because um, it's kind of interesting. You know, you would expect they would be able to integrate the new versions relatively fast, but I guess there are some compatibility issues maybe. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. Anyway, it's good to see, you know, that they are consistently updating. There's also a bunch of um, JavaScript features added like app is packaged, app when ready. You can now use process get heap statistics and uh, use window move to top to get to the Z order to the top basically. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's great. It seems to be pretty cool. So, and I've heard a lot of good things about stability. A lot of people reported it's way more stable than Electron 2.0 or 2. Point whatever it is now, the latest one, even the beta version was. So uh, really, really cool to see it. Hopefully the VS code will release a new version with Electron 3.0 soon, which will mean it will be faster, nicer, and uh, eating less memory. Because I think it was Chrome 66 that introduced that uh, memory optimization thingy. But yeah, anyway. Okay, the next uh, release we got is Unfetch 4, which is the fetch uh, polyfill that is uh, 50 bytes smaller. It's just 498 bytes, which is, I mean, it's its the library from Mr. Develop It, uh, who builds Preact and other super tiny libraries. So that's not surprising, but he somehow managed to make it even smaller. And uh, yeah, you now have the unpackage unfetch slash polyfill, uh, sorry, polyfill, uh, which you can just include in your source and it will just work. So yes, if you're looking for a fetch polyfill that is super tiny, do check it out. Um, I probably you won't find anything smaller to be honest. And uh, yeah, you can also use it from node side with requires and everything. So it works quite nicely. Okay. Next release we got is Nuxt.js version 2.0. It's basically Next.js, but for Vue, uh, this is again, major release. Uh, this uh, introduces, again, updates Webpack to four and Babel to seven. This is probably something we're gonna see for a few more weeks. Um, and it also introduces the create Nuxt app uh, thingy that basically allows you to uh, choose between the server frameworks, UI frameworks, and just scaffold the apps quicker essentially. Okay, next release we got is React DevTools 3.4. Uh, 
um, which basically among the some additional coloring for the profiler includes uh, the thing that I was waiting for support for context consumer and context provider display names because before that it was a bit hard to figure out what the hell's going on now it's actually a bit easier so it's always nice to see those small improvements okay uh, next release we got is node.js version 10.11 uh, which is basically a minor release with no major changes um yeah so i don't think there's anything worth highlighting in this case but uh, be sure to update because it's always good to do that Right, next release we got is Polka version 0.5.0, uh, which finally introduces Varadic root handlers, which means you can now reuse and attach middleware to a specific roots instead of doing that on the app level, as you could only do it before, which was annoying. So now it is more or less, I mean, it's getting closer to the drop-in replacement for Express.js, but just being like, you know, super tiny and fast, which is always nice to see. So if you haven't tried it yet, do give it a shot. It is very nice. Okay, next release we got is Vaporboy Beta. This is a WebAssembly Game Boy emulator that has amazing aesthetic. Just look at this. It's basically Windows 95 and it has a control panel and you can select ROM and uh, let me just mute myself. And we're gonna, there you go. It actually, <laughs> it's just amazing. I mean, it, it's, it works, it's WebAssembly, it works and you can actually like run the map. I don't know what the controls are, but let me try, there you go. AAA and I'm um, gonna scroll to the end. And just, you know, when you think that uh, land, uh, uh, it, where? I guess it generating the map. Is it that intensive? Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, start to start. How do I start? Enter? Then start? Yeah, okay. Forest, uh, that's a very helpful tip. But whatever, you know what? It's a Game Boy emulator and it works and it's amazing and it's WebAssembly, so do check it out if that sounds interesting. Okay, that's it for releases. Now we are in the libraries and demos section and oh boy, do we have some cool stuff this time around. So the first one being JS 13K games as we already talked. Um, the competition came to a conclusion on September 13th actually and I somehow missed the end date. And uh, now we have a list of winners here, Underrun being the first one. Um, there is 29 of them, which have links that you can try out yourself. I believe you probably can find more of them. I'm not sure how exactly, but probably all of them are on GitHub, at least majority of them. So I'm just gonna show you Underrun, which we talked about just before that, um, which looks absolutely insane. Now again, keep in mind, this is a game that is built in JavaScript and is 13 kilobytes in size. 13 kilobytes, this, look at this. This is fully 3D, twin stick shooter with enemies, with pickups, with loot, with maps. There's three levels in here. And all of that is in 13 kilobytes, 13 kilobytes. Just, just think about it for a second. And it works on a perfect 60 FPS per second. 60, 60 frames per second without any lags or anything. Talking about efficient software and there's even uh, enemies that shoot back at you. And I, I don't think I actually managed to finish the first level. I don't know where's the end here, but uh, I think I got killed first time. Just, just think for a second, this is 13 kilobyte game. In 3D, in JavaScript, in your browser. System still offline. I don't know what we are doing. I guess we have to kill. Okay, what? You know what? <laughs> Not gonna play it now. There are other demos that are just as impressive as this one. So there's like this chroma incident, which is also pretty cool. Um, it has some, like the uh, the idea of the game is that you kill those monsters, you pick up things, and then you can turn on the light, will which will change your weapon and how it works essentially. So if you stand on the red, you will actually have the uh, flamethrower, if you stand on the purple, I don't know what is that. I think a flamethrower is way more fun. It, it's also 16 kilobytes. It's insane. Like just, you know, just check out those demos. Most of them have source code uh, published on GitHub. So you can actually go ahead to the GitHub and check out how the game was built and what is the build process is used there. So typically there are custom build scripts that, you know, compress everything to the minimum basically. But it's really awesome. Like all of those are really, really cool. Okay, uh, next project we have is a Dark Wasp. Um, 
distributed storage for functions. I'm not sure why it's called storage, but from what I understood is basically a distributed peer-to-peer uh, -peer function execution system. So the idea is that you can create those dark wasp things and they connect to the specific um, socket, I guess, with the peer name. And then they can either uh, set functions. So in this case, they, uh, this peer sets the Fibonacci and random functions. And then the other peers, when they connect, they can invoke those functions from any peers that have them basically, right? So it's sort of distributed function calling. I'm not sure why is it called storage, but it does look interesting. I have not looked into how exactly it was built, but uh, as a sort of learning project, it's definitely worth a look. Maybe, you know, maybe you are looking for something like this. Do check it out. Looks quite curious. Okay. Uh, next thing we got is the console colors uh, browser console logs with colors. That's pretty much all it does. Uh, in case you didn't know, you can actually colorize the output in a browser console. It does take a bit of time to do that. And this library essentially does it for you. Um, the cool thing is that actually Chalk, the my favorite library for coloring things that has a very nice color palette, Chalk 2 is only usable in Node.js right now, right? And there's been a lot of people who are asking uh, for Chalk for browser and they recently started drafting Chalk 3. And uh, one of the targets is actually make it work in the browser, which is really good. So I'm really waiting for that. Okay. Next library or next project we got, I guess, is Deer, a modern, fast, beautiful note taking app built on Electron and React. I uh, couldn't tell you more about it because it doesn't actually have any screenshots or anything like this for whatever reason. If you build a desktop app, please include screenshots. Like if you say it's the modern, fast, beautiful note taking app, show me how it looks like for real. It's not that hard, but it is open source. It is free. So, you know, if you're looking for a note taking app or if you're looking to learn how to build one, do have a look at this project. You will probably find everything you want here. Okay, next project we got is TensorFlow Rex Run. Somebody built a TensorFlow JS based AI that uh, runs the Rex runner, you know, the, the thing, the dinosaur thing that you get when the Chrome is uh, offline, right? So somebody built a TensorFlow implementation in JavaScript that basically solves that. And there's like the, seems like it does it in four generations, at least so far. I guess it gets more enemies further on and probably will need a few more generations, but it is a really cool study case basically. So um, yeah, do check it out if that sounds interesting. <laughs> right, next project we got is Worker Plugin. Uh, this one is really cool. So it's uh, extension or I guess the plugin for Webpack, right? That adds automatic bundling and compilation for web workers. So before when you wrote worker, new worker, worker JS, it like the webpack did not understood that, right? So the webpack would just ignore that and be like, I don't know what this worker JS is. And I will just, you know, it will be loaded on invocation, which was annoying. And then you had to manage workers yourself, put them in some place, then, you know, do the static routing and whatever. And was a bit of a pain in the ass. So now you just throw this plugin in and this worker file will get bundled automatically using Webpack, which is pretty amazing. All you have to do is literally one, one line change. <laughs> this is amazing. This is from Google Chrome Labs. So Google team, thank you very much for that. That looks just amazing. Okay, uh, next thing we got is WWW basic, uh, implementation of basic. So the basic programming language designed to be easy to run on the web. Uh, you can literally just include the script here. And then you get the type text basic and you can write basic. I guess that could be used for uh, teaching purposes because I think I think in school when we had like uh, informatics classes, uh, we first thing we learned was actually basic and drawing some stuff in graphics. So that might be fun to do. I don't know, like how is it like complete implementation features? It does support graphics. Okay, cool. That is That is great. So that probably could be used uh, for teaching quite a lot. Okay, next thing we got is TPMJS. Uh, TPMJS lets you experiment with a software trusted platform module in your browser. Now here's the thing. I think trusted platform module is a hardware thing, but I never worked with anything called this way. So I don't know what is that. So let's read a wiki. Trusted platform module or TPM also known is ISO IEC 11889. 
is an international standard for a secure crypto processor, a dedicated microcontroller designed to secure hardware through integrated crypto. Okay, so it's a hardware thing, uh, crypto processor. Okay, so it's a basically JavaScript emulated hardware crypto processor that you can play with in your browser. Pretty neat. And it seems like you can even see the registers and seeds and everything. And that that is actually quite cool. Manufacture reset. Okay, that is, that's pretty neat. Secure key. Okay, there's even a tutorial here. This is awesome. So yes, if you are interested in playing around with uh, TPM and uh, if you never heard of it or maybe want to learn from it or about it or yeah, just ch check it out. This looks quite amazing actually. Okay, next thing we got is a node release lines, API for Node.js release metadata. So if you have tools that work with Node.js and you want to keep uh, updated like you want to know what's the lts release line what's the latest one what's the modern one and so on and so forth this allows you to do that programmatically it is from the nw team which means that it's probably used in nwjs which is uh, yeah what you would expect basically seems to have quite nice api so yeah basically if you need to know node versions uh, by their release lines then this is what you would use okay next thing we got is van ts when is a recombinant? Ugh, re God damn it! <laughs> Let me try that again. Recombinant design pattern for state machines based on gene expression, which sounds very hard, and I don't know what it does, but uh, maybe you know, and maybe you was looking for a library like this, so um, check it out. <laughs> That's literally all I can tell you, or I can tell you about it because I don't know what any of those words mean. Like, okay, I know what state machines do, but. Um, is there like some examples here that explains what the hell is happening? When counter price push, I know. Okay, you know what? This is this is not the thing I understand. Okay, all right. Next thing we got is a semantic code search demo from a GitHub research team, which I thought was pretty neat. So I thought I would just demo it. Unfortunately, as far as I know, there is no source code available for this, but um, I found this to be a really cool idea. So. Um, the point here is that they trained, uh, I guess, a neural network to recognize a bit of code based on a natural language input. So you can say, scrape data from the website, right? It's a natural language input, and you would get a bunch of code snippets that would supposedly do that, right? I think it's a really great idea, and probably you can turn it into a full-fledged uh, search engine, although that would require a lot of training and a lot of probably supervised training. And um, as, as some people on the Hacker News noted in a discussion of these things was like, maybe GitHub should first fix their basic search, which is absolutely true because it's not quite up to par yet. But nonetheless, it is a really neat experiment. And uh, if this is what we will be using for code search in the future, instead of using Stack Overflow, that would be really cool. Maybe we should try to build something like this on one of the development streams. I think we can use maybe TensorFall for that. Not sure if that will work, but uh, we can try anyway. Sounds like a fun project to try out. Okay, next thing we got is JS Ordinal, a simple utility to translate from regular numbers to their ordinal representations. Um, note here just for English, so this is not localized. So you can basically, you know, you can Say it from first, second to 11th, 12th, whatever. So the ordinal numbers, yes, nothing complicated here. Maybe you were looking for that, but uh, you know, if you are doing something like this, I would recommend looking into the tools that allow you to do internationalized uh, versions of that. Okay, continuing, we got fingerprint JS2, another, um, like this is not a new library. It's been around for a while, but I just thought I highlighted it because a lot of people seem to assume that incognito mode is actually incognito. Well, um, the thing is, well, okay, I have my JavaScript disabled here, but uh, if I re-enable that, and if I disable my ad block, um, so the thing is that it is possible to fingerprint a browser based on a bunch of information that your browser actually gives away, that even if you open your incognito mode, um, you will get exactly the same fingerprint 
right? So your incognito mode actually is not that incognito. Obviously, if you have something like ad block or, you know, script blocker, um, this won't work, right? But never assume that your incognito mode is safe if you are not blocking all the scripts. So that's just a lesson. And if you're looking to track your users and to make sure the users are unique, well, this the fingerprint JS library is for you. Right, continuing, we got Arcus, a faceted arc diagram for project management. Uh, there's a very fancy visualization here of what you can do with it. Uh, so if you want to draw fancy arcs, then this is a library that you want to have a look at. Uh, it seems to be extracted. Uh, okay, this is data. No, yeah, uh, it's, uh, I think it's MIT licensed and everything. No, it's actually G uh, GPL3. Okay, so it's GPL3 license. Bear that in mind if you're working with organizations that do not allow those. Okay, uh, continuing, we got from now, a tiny utility for human readable time differences between now and past or future dates. So it's literally very easy to um, throw in a date and it will tell you a human readable format in English once again, the difference from now, uh, you know, how many dates, uh, days, years, months, hours, minutes, before or after the date, which is something you, do from time to time and it's quite nice to have a library that just does it for you and that is also quite tiny. Okay, next thing we got is Leo or Lio. I'm not sure how to read that correctly. No JS to browser the easy way. So it's um, essentially a bunch of utilities that are bundled together in a simple way that is no decision making, no configuration needed. It just works, so the magic thing. And uh, Leo is the easiest way to transform Node.js modules into browser compatible libraries. Uh, essentially it just uses Browserify, Babel and Uglify.js uh, without any configs. And you can just say, so either you can pre-compile your own modules with it to publish them for browser use, or you can drag and uh, install any third party module in NPM through it to make it available for the browser, which is quite nice to be honest. So it looks to be pretty neat. Uh, you know, if you are having problems with using node modules in the browser, do check it out. Maybe this library will solve your problems. Okay, next thing we got is a circuit B, a non-intrusive circuit breaker for Node.js. And here the author should set for Node.js HTTP requests because this is exactly what it does. Uh, it allows you to set breakpoints on requests. And uh, if something goes wrong with the request to those addresses, the circuit breaker will essentially trigger, right? Uh, and it all like the cool thing is that it allows you not just track those failures, but also set out timeouts. So you can actually say, okay, you know, if we're requesting this domain, the maximum timeout would be this. And if we're requesting this domain, the maximum timeout would be this. And all that done in a centralized manner. And uh, you can even, it even has like the specific error codes that you can catch. And it provides the overall metrics about the requests later on, so on and so forth. So it seems to be pretty full face. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. There is a compatibility thing. So it uses node async hooks. So it only works with node 8.1 or later, but this is the LTS right now. So this is what you should be using anyway. Right, next thing we got is a nice demo of what off screen canvas is possible uh, or is capable of. Uh, so, off screen canvas, something we talked about in a couple of uh, previous podcasts, and uh, it was released in Chrome 69 and uh, it allows you to do a pretty neat things uh, like the 3GS animations, right? And uh, just compare the normal way of animating it with off screen canvas rendering. Look at how much smoother this is. This is just really cool. One more tiny step towards the native performance. This is like really great. Okay. Um, last thing we got in the demos is the announcement from Zeitgeist. Uh, so you can now use Now Service, the publishing service they have, the deployment service, to do to you can now bundle it together with GitHub. And you can do automatic deployments for every single push. You can automatically alias master branch to custom domains and you can in do instant rollbacks when reverting the commits, which is really cool. There's like more documentation about it and more info if you're interested. 
Uh, worth noting that now shell is free for open source projects. There's obviously limitations, but uh, you know, if you're doing open source stuff, do check it out. It is pretty cool. They also work with Docker, by the way. Okay, and uh, now we're coming to the different interesting, funny, silly things. And the first thing I want to note is this a Linux capable hand solderable processor that costs $1. We are at this point in time where you get a system on the chip that is just just $1. Just look at this thing. Uh the like the important part is that it's hand solderable. So yeah, okay, it has a lot of legs. This one is probably I mean, I don't know, is there any specs here? Uh, an interesting chip. So there's a link here. Uh, there's a discussion. Doesn't seem like there's any technical. Oh, what well, you know, whatever. They say it hand solderable, which means it's probably relatively easy to solder it by hand. Uh, even if it has this many legs, it's typically not a big problem if you have a correct socket. It is a one gigahertz ARM Cortex A8 processor, and you can just run like one dollar. And if you buy it in smaller quantities, it's just three bucks. Just comparing it to the current solutions, we have uh, chips like, you know, if you buy it uh, in thousand quantities, it's 25 bucks. And if you buy it for one, it's 40 bucks. And now it's just down to three. So it's like 10 times cheaper, which is just insane. So embedded computing is, you know, it's a good time to be essentially an embedded computing uh, enthusiast because you got like BeagleBone, Raspberry Pi Zero, Olimax, and all those guys doing super cheap, tiny boards. And now, now probably we're gonna see even cheaper things, which which is just awesome. Just wanted to highlight this. Okay, uh, next thing we got is the, uh, yes, this uh, CSS bug in uh, Safari. That allows you to restart any iOS device with just CSS. So there's the source code. Uh, the source code is really stupid. You just have the background that repeats um, again and again and again. And you just have a lot of divs to make the um, body quite large, right? So you get the div is like each div is 10,000 pixel size and it blurs the background. And it seems like the Safari just renders the background a lot of times and just gets into the buffer overflow and just dies. And it seems to be WebKit specific. So it's a WebKit bug. So don't open this link on your iPhone or Mac OS because it does crashes Safari and Mac OS as well, if I remember, uh, which is, yeah, quite, quite silly, but a uh, good thing somebody found it. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it's, it's already fixed in the upstream at least, which is neat. And another insane bug we have in Safari in iOS 12 is that if you use array reverse, um, the local variable, uh, the state of a local variable is preserved even when refreshing the page, which is like, how does this even work? So yes, uh, somebody already wrote an array reverse polyfill for iOS 12 that fixes that. It was like <laughs> just face palming all over it. They already fixed it. So again, props to the WebKit team. They did fix it quite quick, uh, at least it did in upstream. I don't know how quick will it go uh, in. I, it's not scary. It's just, you know, it's it's mind boggling. It's like, how do you debug something like, how, like the point here is like, how do you catch something like this? I think how much time do you have to spend after reversing an array and refreshing a page and seeing the same state? How long will you, how long will it take to figure out that this was a bug and the array reverse is responsible for it? I, just, I don't want to know how much pain does this person here who wrote this answer on Stack Overflow had figuring this whole thing out. But yeah, it's definitely, it's kind of like, you can read more about it here, but it's kind of crazy. All right, guys, um, that's actually it from my side. That is all the news I had for today. If you have any other things that I might have missed or maybe your own libraries or projects, do send them over right now in a Twitch chat or if you missed the podcast, if you're listening to this on Dev2 or YouTube or CastBox, feel free to send them over in our Discord chat or in my email, in my Twitter or in the BXJS Weekly GitHub account. 
more than happy to happy uh, more than happy to happy yes exactly i i think i've been speaking a bit too much today we'll be more than happy to cover your stuff um yeah and if there's nothing else left then uh, we can just wrap this up here for today and go have nice rest of the weekends all right, I'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, gather your thoughts and send stuff into the chat if you have anything. Feel free to send the questions if you have them as well. We'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. If not, then, well, I'll just go play some Warframe in Destiny 2. I've been doing that a bit too much, but I'm going to continue doing that for the rest of, um, I guess, until I get bored. All right. So it seems like no more questions. Um... You missed the entire episode. No worries, man. You can watch the entire episode on YouTube. It will be uploaded afterwards or on Twitch right here because it's available right away. My day job, uh, currently I am employed at the University of Leipzig as a postdoc. So I'm doing a research by day and JavaScript by night. <laughs> I'm also participating in a bunch of uh, startup projects that are, you know, trying to like make them work and see if that flies. But uh, yeah, so I'm researcher javascript developer and uh yeah i guess <laughs> something like this all right um any more questions or links or anything else you want to guys uh, let me try that again anything else you guys want to chat about or ask me about or whatever uh, yes, sure. Do send your idea over. I'm always more than happy to talk to people who want to start new things um, and see if we can figure something out. Even if I can figure, you know, even if I don't uh, think that I will um, be able to work with you, I can always recommend some guys and um, yeah. You speak all my languages. Okay, that is slightly terrifying. <laughs> All right, let's see what you mean about that. Um, there's basically, a, there's an email in my channel description or there's a Discord chat. You can also join there and just poke me there. So basically can contact me whatever the way you want. Right, doesn't seem like there's any more things you guys want to talk about. So I would suggest we just wrap it up here for today. So as usual, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for staying through the whole stream. If you missed it, no worries, you can watch it on YouTube, on Twitch, on Dev2, or listen to it on CastBox as usual. Feel free to join our Discord server for chats and uh, for help if you need it with uh, JavaScript or programming. We'll be more than happy to help you. Thank you for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're listening this later. And uh, I see you next time. Bye.